Okay, so in the last section, we uh, understood the relationship between computability and typology. We're modeling processes in natural language, possible and impossible ones. And we've understood that the computable functions are necessary but insufficient for doing so. So we need to refine our notion of computability. We need types of computability, right? So these are our encyclopedia of categories. We need to enrich it. So what is some structure that we can impose on computation? Well, one type of structure is given by what's called the regular languages or the, the class of things computed by finite state automata. Recall that a regular language is just the class of languages for which memory required is finite with respect to the input. Okay, so if I take a regular expression like, you know, BA star, which means have, you know, one or more sequences of BA, right? I have my alphabet B and A and I want sequences of them, right? My finite memory is encoded in these two states. They're finite. There's two of them. I can't accept a B because it doesn't put me in a final state. I can't accept BA because it puts me in a final state. Um, and I can accept one or you know zero or more of them. Okay. I can also have a regular expression like B A star, which says have at least you know have one B um, followed by as many A's as you'd like, right? So that accepts strings like B B A B A A A A A, right? Same alphabet, uh, same number of states, different number of transitions on them. Okay. That's what makes a finite state automata. There should be quite familiar to those who are attending this lecture. Okay. Um, so these are functions from, you know, sigma star, right, because they'll take anything in sigma star and turn it, you know, and say it's accepted or not, right? Do you end up in a final state, right? Then you might say, hold on, I'm used to weighted automata, meaning I want to map things to real numbers. Well, that's true. You can certainly map things to real numbers. That just requires you to, you know, do something a little bit different. Instead of having, you know, whether something you, you can leave with an A or not, you just assign, assign particular weights onto a particular transition, right? So um, what this means is you have, you know, um, you know, initial states and final states, and then every transition between them takes one of your two alphabet symbols and puts a weight on it. And then uh, you can sort of see how that works here, where you have, you know, what happens if you're the, an A, you can have an operator representation for this as well, where you view it as a matrix, right? So you have an initial state that says, you know, I get some initial vector here, and here it's one and zero. And then I have a matrix which tells me what I do every time I see an A, here I do what I do every time I see a B, right? So from state 1 to 1, you have a point 4 if you take an A, right? If you go from state 1 to 2, right, you have a point 2 chance here, etc., etc., right? So if I want to compute a B, all I have to do is sum through the paths that I get from, multi that I get from multiplying all the different ways of computing a B, right? So point 0.4, 0.3, 0.6 right, and 0 0.2, 0 0.1, 0.6, right, so I just, you know, multiply these and then sum them together to get the, probably, you know, the weight of the string, right, so it's a linear transformation here, okay, okay, so that's if you want, you know, sort of a weighted automaton. Now, um, what if, you know, what we, we were considering not mapping strings to real values or strings to zeros and ones, we are considering mapping strings to other strings. So, you know, but we can do this too. If you thought, you know, well, if we have Booleans or real valued functions, what if we switch out, you know, that output to something different? Um, so we can generalize this concept of regularity to consider various output semi-rings, not just Booleans or real numbers, okay? So, um, you know, you can have, remember that a semi-ring is just a set with two operations, each of which have, you know, its corresponding um, uh, identity guy here, right? So for, uh, you know, in particular, uh, for the Boolean semi-rings, right, you're gonna have, you know, conjunction and disjunction, and then your identity are just zero and one. The semi-ring that we're going to use today for the rest of the talk is called the string semi-ring. This is where the outputs the input takes the form of strings in sigma star, and the output takes the form of strings in sigma star, okay? Now, here, uh, the way that you put stuff together is by concatenation, right? Here, the identity sigma is just the, you know, empty string, and then the infinite string here. Um, and so we're looking at functions that are mapping strings to strings, okay? Notice that our strings to reals also shows up here. Um, you know, you can think of many, many, many other ones. You can even have a language semi-ring that has uh, the power set of sigma star. But for today, we're going to just look at the string semi-ring. Okay, so we have the concept of regular languages, and we can generalize it using semi-rings to consider um, what are 
called rational functions. Why are they called a regular language but a rational function? Well, there's some terminological confusion here. And but for, for what you should remember out of this is that the rational functions are just the generalization of the regular languages to cover these various different semi-rings. Okay? So you know what's important is that the rational functions, which are those that are computed by a one-way finite state transducer, which we'll see in a second, are a subclass of the computable functions. Okay, and I've included the finite state automata in here too, right? Which, as we just saw, can sort of be handled, right? So the rational functions impose some structure. They say, what can I do with finite memory here, right? In the form of the finite state machine, okay? All right, so let's look at what is a type of process that is rational, right? Well, one type of process that's rational, right? It's sufficiently described by a rational function is suffixation, right? Um, so here's an example, like whole English. You can take a verb like hold and then uh, add the suffix ing onto it. Okay, so you go from hold to holding. Okay, this can be done very easily with a finite state machine here, right? So here I have my input here, hold, which is augmented by beginning and end of string symbols. And as I as I read through inputs and segments here, I'm going to output various output segments. Okay, right? So if I see an H, I output an H. I see an O, I output an O. I see an L, I output an L. I see a D, I output a D, and when I see the end of string symbol here, then I output our suffix example, okay? All right, so hold becomes holding. Let's just watch it happen again. Okay, right. Now notice, all we had to do was traverse the finite state machine, right? We didn't require anything more than a finite notion of memory, right? So this is a rational function because you're going from an input to an output in a rational way, not, you know, rational in the um, intuitive sense of the word. Okay, right. Now notice something in particular about this um, finite state transducer, right? The transducer is deterministic, okay? So the deterministic transducers mean that you get one choice per symbol per state, right? You can't say I have, you know, an A and I have two options of what to do with it. I either map the A to a B or I map the A to an A, right? You get one option, okay? It's deterministic, okay? So the deterministic one-way finite state transducers compute what are called sequential functions. Okay, these were discovered by Schutz and Berger in the 1960s. Um, they're deterministic, as I said, right? And the determinist, you know, the property that determinism imposes on the sequential functions is a property called bounded look-ahead, right? And what that means is that the read-head on a particular tape can only look, at, you know, a bounded distance into the future. Okay, okay. So what are some examples of sequential functions in linguistics? Well, as we just saw, you know, suffixation is one, because you can do it with a deterministic FST. Prefixation is one. Partial reduplication is one. And progressive and regressive harmony are also sequential functions. And if you want to learn more about this, you can read uh, Chandley 2017 or Heinz and Lay 2013, or that survey that I showed at the beginning of the talk. Okay. So now we have a principal distinction between functions that are sequential which I, you know, have listed a little bit down here, and functions that are not sequential but are still rational, okay? So we've narrowed down a little bit. We've imposed two notions of structure. So here we have, you know, the difference between progressive and regressive harmony and sour grapes and circumambient unbounded harmony is the difference between being deterministic and non-deterministic, right? This is the same for other processes in phonology I've listed like tone plateauing and dissimilation. Um, and so we can make a principled computational distinction between these properties purely on the basis of what their functions tell us, okay? So whether a function is deterministic or not, right, gives you the, you know, a class of patterns that it belongs to. So here we're starting to make some typological distinctions. But still, we're not being refined enough because, you know, the difference between sequentiality and rationality isn't enough to tell us why something like you know, harmony is attested and, and circuit maybe an unbounded harmony is attested and total reduplication is also attested, but polynomial reduplication is not attested, right? Because we don't have a refined enough notion about what is out here enough to make, still make stated claims about attestedness or commonality. Okay, so for this, we need to understand uh, something more expressive. And this is the class called the regular functions. Now, the regular functions, you might think, well, we just thought about regular languages. The regular functions are a superclass of the um, rational functions, okay? 
And if you want a functional interpretation, you can say a function is regular if the image of a string of length n has length, you know, it, it grows linearly in the length of n, okay? So this is proved by Nathan Lode. Um, now, the regular functions are computable by two-way finite state transducers, streaming string transducers, and a number of other formalisms, okay? Some examples of linguistic patterns that sit inside the regular functions are total reduplication, triplication, um, all the rational functions, and all the sequential functions, okay? So what's the difference between a one-way transducer and a two-way transducer? Well, it's as follows. Let's look at partial duplication, right? And let's take an example like pat goes to pop hat, okay? So here, this is like initial CV copying, right? So a one-way transducer has to sort of memorize because you just have to look at the edge of the reduplicate here, right? Ah uh, to, you know, and say, well, I've seen an ah uh, that came after a T, and so I need to output ta ta, right? Or I need to see um, an ah uh, that came after a P and output a P A, right? So the A here, you know, is, is doing quite a lot of work here, which we can analyze through a formalism called the origin information of a function, from which you can look at Boyanchik 2014. A two-way transducer, on the other hand, sort of clo more closely captures the idea of linguistic copying because it has the ability to rewind on a tape. So a one-way transducer can only look forward, a two-way transducer can look back. So the way a two-way transducer does the CV copying is it reads through this word uh, up until the edge of the reduplicate and then rewinds to the beginning of the word and then rewrites the word again, right? So it reads through PA to get the output PA, rewinds, and then reads through PAT to get PAT. So, right, pop PAT. Okay, so that's a one way transducer versus a two way transducer. Rational functions you can do with one way transducer, regular functions you can do with a two way transducer. They're more expressive. Everything you can do with a one-way transducer, you can do with a two-way transducer. Now, so it should be pretty obvious why total reduplication can be done with a two-way transducer, right? You read through the whole word once, rewind through the whole word, and then read through the whole word again, okay? And it should be obvious why it can't be done with a one-way transducer, because for every input word that was of length n, you have to have, you know, a some certain number of states. And that would need to grow and grow and grow and grow. So you'd get, you know, blow up in the number of states, right? So it's just infeasible to model um, total reduplication this way because you'd have to have as many number of states as input length and those can be infinite. So regular versus rational, we're getting a little bit more of the way there, right? So now we have a set of functions that's going to cover total reduplication, right? And it's distinct from those that are going to cover partial duplication. So we have a principal distinction now between partial duplication, which is a sequential function, and total reduplication, which is a regular function, okay? And we also have a distinction between total reduplication uh, and polynomial um, and exponential function or copying functions here, right? Because we have a class of things that could be linguistic now, right? This is the stuff that is a little attested, and stuff that could be non-linguistic, right, which is unattested, right? So that's a bit of a strong claim, but that's what our, our, our distinctions here have given us so far. We have this sort of nested uh, notion of increasing structural complexity, okay, um, that is going to uh, allow us to rule out or rule in certain types of functions, right? Okay, so that's the difference between regular versus rational, okay? So what now, what does, what class do these guys belong to? They're unattested, but they still have to, you know, they can't just be some, they're not arbitrarily computable. I mean, you know, we, we'd like to understand whether these set, sit inside some, some nice class here. And in fact, they do. These are what are called polyregular functions, okay? So a regular function had linear growth in terms of the output. A polyregular function has growth that's nonlinear, right? It's, it's polynomial with respect to the output, right? It's into the K. What is that K? Well, that k comes from the number of, uh, uh, well, so, so polyregular functions are computed by pebble transducers, right? And the k comes from the k pebbles that they're allowed to drop here. They're like stacks, right? So here's an example of a, of a pebble automaton or the run of a pebble transducer, right? You have a word like um, AABAB and it outputs its prefixes in reverse, right? So it drops various pebbles along the way, similarly to how a stack does it. Some examples of polyregular functions are all the regular functions because it's a super set. And then it also includes the iterated prefix copy, the polynomial copy, and then that you know, exponential copy that we saw earlier as well. Okay, so polyregular, now we have a really nice 
landscape of possible functions here, right? We have the sequential, rational, regular, polyregular, and computable class, and you know the diff and there, you know, stuff that sits inside these classes um, is sort of well behaved with respect to the class, right? Metathesis, progressive harmony, and fixation are all sequential. Total reduplication is not sequential, but it's regular, right? However, um, progressive harmony is both sequential and regular because they sit inside each other. And even though exponential copying is unattested, it sits inside this polyregular function, right? So it's allowed to, you know, we're allowed to understand some properties of it, even though it's unattested, right? So now we, the, the facts of computability have given us this, this ability to say, even though you could, you're not attested in any of the languages that we know of, you could be, right? it's possible to understand what it would mean for that function to be attested. And that's what the properties of polyregularity um, show us, right? So when we think about what's a possible typology versus an impossible typology, we need to have these types of categories, exactly as Alexander von Humboldt had said. And so as I put to you today, the, the uh, computable functions and the subclasses of computable functions give us this encyclopedia of categories to analyze the encyclopedia of types that we find in the world's languages. Okay, so that's it for the second section. Next, we will talk about um, uh, learning.